Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you praise and we thank you for your goodness and mercy. Thank you, dear God, that you loved us enough to send the very best, your son Jesus. And we just pray, God, that you would touch each and every one of us today. Some of us may not be feeling as good. Some of us may be tired, but I pray that you would strengthen us. Look upon the absent portion, dear God, my wife and uh, Sister Yolanda and those that may be sick and not feeling well, and Mother Snipes. Just continue to bless them, dear God, and I pray, Lord, that you would word my mouth and give me what to say and how to say it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to Judges. Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. And I'll start reading in verse 8. Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 8. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. It says, The Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites, who said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak at Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abyssalite. And his son Gideon was beating wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of fearless courage. Now, many of us have heard this story before, uh, may have even preached it before. And Gideon is a unique individual. He's, he's one of my favorite characters. I think Gideon represents who all of us are sometimes in our lives. The children of Israel were in bondage. And uh, the Midianites happened to be the, the group of people that had them in bondage at this time. It was either the Midianites, the Amalekites, the Jebusites, one of those sites always oppressed Israel. But Israel was oppressed not because God was trying to punish them, but because of their own disobedience. You see, every time Israel got out of pocket and got to the place where they stopped calling on God, they fell into apostasy. Or they were taken captive by somebody because of their lack of obedience and love for God. And that's what happened here. The book of Judges is called the Dark Ages of Israel because right after Joshua died, the children of Israel didn't listen to any of the advice Joshua gave them. You know, Joshua was a man that loved God. God used Joshua. And so, you know, when Joshua got ready to die, he had a chance to talk to the children of Israel. And one of the things he said to them was, Choose you this day whom you'll serve, either God or man, but you got to make a choice. And he also told the children of Israel, don't forget to tell your children and your children's children how I delivered you from Egypt. And I used to look, I said, well, why, why was that so important and significant? Well, this is the reason why. If you don't let your children know about the delivering power of God, when they fall into bondage, how are they going to get out? And that's what happened in Israel. Because their forefathers refused to tell them how they were delivered, how God blessed them and kept them and watched over them, fed them when they were hungry and, and, and delivered them from the hand of the Egyptians, they just fell into following other gods. And so, and a lot of times what happened was they would fall under the, the, the gods of who their oppressors were. And that's why it says right here, don't be afraid of the God of the Midianites. So here we have Gideon. Gideon was a good man, but he wasn't a soldier. He wasn't a warrior. In fact, when God found Gideon, he was threshing wheat in a wine press. And the way you thresh wheat is, you take the wheat that's been plucked and you throw it up in the air. And because the weight is different, the wheat will fall one way and the tares will fall the other. And you pick up the wheat and you throw away the tares. Well, he was doing this in a wine press, which is like literally doing it in a hole because he was trying to hide from the enemy. And so when you think about this, God calls this man a mighty man of valor while he's hiding from the enemy. That almost seems crazy. 
But that's how God operates. God chooses the foolish things in this world to confound the wise. If you look at the, the people in, in history that God called, a lot of times the people that God called, they weren't special. They weren't brilliant. They weren't strong. They weren't mighty. But because they were obedient and willing to obey God, God used them. God empowered them. God anointed them. And it's the same thing with us. God will use us in spite of our age, whether we're young or whether we're old, in spite of our intelligence or lack thereof. God doesn't concern himself with those things. What God wants is us to be obedient to him. When you make up your mind you're going to obey God, that's when God's going to use you. When you make up your mind that you're going to be God's servant and not always look to be rising to the top, that's when God will use you. You see, a lot of times, and this is really, this happens in church all the time, and y'all know, a lot of times people in church get put in positions not because God called them, but because we think that, well, they've been here for a long time. That's no reason to put somebody in a position of authority or put somebody in a position. You know, uh, they faithful. Uh, they pay tithes. Uh, they carry the pastor's briefcase. Those minerals are reasons why you should put somebody in a position. You put somebody in a position because God wants them there. It's just like with David. God wanted David to be king. Saul didn't want to hear that. That's why he tried to kill David. But Jonathan, the rightful heir to the throne, knew that God called David. And that's why before Jonathan left this earth, he gave David his cloak, his sword, and everything that represented him as a prince of Israel. Because Jonathan was spiritual enough to see, my dad ain't walking with God. David walking with God. And so Jonathan, and that's the way we have to be saints of God. Sometimes we have a tendency to be like Samuel. When, when God sent Samuel down to Jesse's house to choose a king, we look on the outward. God doesn't look at the outward. He looks in here. He looks at the heart. Does that person have a heart to want to serve me? Does that person have a humble spirit? Because those are the people that God is looking for. He'll take care of all the rest. You know, I'm not smart, I stutter, I'm old, I'm young. God don't care about that stuff. What God cares about is, is your heart willing to serve me? That's why a lot of times we have people right in our midst that are anointed and ready to be used by God and we overlook them because they don't fit the mold. You know, well, he don't dress like a preacher or she don't dress like a missionary or, you know, they don't sound like they say they're sanctified. Or God ain't concerned about that. What God is concerned about is your heart. And that's what Gideon had. Gideon wanted his people free. And, and how do I know that? Because as, 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 as the angel of the Lord was talking to Gideon, Gideon said, Lord, what's going on? How come our people are suffering so? How come our people are in bondage? And he, he, was, he, was, he, had, you know, he had a legitimate gripe. But <clears throat> that showed he had a heart for his people. But he also had a heart for God. Let me just say this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn, turn to uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And this is a New Testament example of what I'm talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And this is the Apostle Paul talking about his infirmities. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting the first verse. It says, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Now, Paul is talking about himself. He's talking in the third person. He's talking about how God lifted him up into the third heaven. There are not too many people that had that testimony where they see heaven while they're here on earth. But Paul had that testimony. Not only did Paul have a testimony about being in the third heaven, but it said he received revelations that no man ever heard. So I look at that and I say, wow, that's awesome. 
But let's keep reading. Verse 4. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Paul saw things that he couldn't even tell anybody. But verse 5. Of such an one I will glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that were given me, that was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, because, because Paul had these great revelations and insights from God, it said that God allowed Paul to have a thorn in his flesh. And it, it tells you right there that the thorn in the flesh was a messenger from Satan sent to buffet him. And the word buffet means to beat. Now, a lot of people speculate as to what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. I mean, there's some preachers that say Paul had a, Paul had a sinful habit, or some people say Paul uh, was, was blind, had bad eyesight. And some people say, you know, that Paul's thorn in the flesh was his arrogance. And I tend to lean toward the arrogant thing, because you have to understand something about Paul. Paul was one of the few people that didn't fit the normal paradigm of the type of people that God calls. And I explain this. Usually when God calls people, he calls people that are unqualified, like Peter the fisherman, or, or, or Matthew the tax collector, or uh, Gideon, the guy that was hiding from the enemy, or um, Samson the whoremonger, you know. But in a rare twist, God chose Saul of Tarsus because he was qualified. See, you have to understand something. He was a Pharisee. Saul of Tarsus knew the Bible better than anybody. Anybody. He, he, was, a fair, he was trained by Gamaliel, the, the greatest teacher of the Old Testament in the Bible. That's who trained Paul. So, okay, Elder Stevens, what are you getting at? What am I getting at is this. In order for God to really use Paul, he had to make him fit into that paradigm. He had to make Paul weak. Because Paul went on to say, his strength is made perfect in weakness. He had to humble Paul. See, Paul was arrogant. He was cocky. He knew a lot. So God had to say, okay, I'm going to use you, but I got to take you down a notch. And that's why he gave Paul the thorn in the flesh. And verse 7 tells it. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations that was given me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. God did not want Paul to get arrogant and cocky because of all this revelation he was receiving. Now, what was the thorn in the flesh? Well, I have my theories, and I'll give you my theory. My theory is the, the thorn in Paul's flesh was the ex exorbitant amount of suffering he went through. See, you have to understand something. Paul never had a day of peace and rest. Everywhere he went, there was trouble. They rose up to kill him. They stoned him. They left him for dead. They, 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 they beat him with stripes. Same way Jesus got beat, Paul got that three times. He got beat with rods. And what they did when they beat somebody with rods is they hung you upside down and smashed the bottom of your feet till they were broken. That happened to Paul. All right? He was shipwrecked, stranded, abandoned. His own co-workers abandoned him. His own peers abandoned him. He spent a third of his ministry in a prison cell. So what do I, what do I think the thorn in the flesh was? That was it. Nobody suffered like Paul and lived to tell it. In fact, when he shared the story about seeing the third heaven, some people believe that was when he got stoned and they thought he was dead. That's when they believe that's when Paul saw heaven, which kind of makes sense because if you're dead, you won't see heaven. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, 
that it might depart from me. Three times Paul went to the Lord and said, God, give me a break. Three times. Doesn't that sound reminiscent of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Three times Jesus went to God and said, God, let this cup pass from me. But it ended like this. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You see, right in the very beginning when Saul of Tarsus was going down the road to Damascus and he got blinded and saw Jesus, when Ananias took him under his wing, he said, I want you to go tell Saul the things he must suffer for my sake. See, even before he even got started in ministry, God was letting him know, you're going to suffer for my sake. See, we don't like to hear that. Because a lot of people think being called to the ministry is glamorous. Oh, I'm going to get my calling and I'm going to be like T.D. Jakes. You know, I'm going to have me a big church, you know, full of tired paying members. See, that's, the, that's the, the false image that people get when you think about ministry. Oh, I'm going to be like Joel Osteen. I'm going to have a, a stadium to preach in. Well, maybe God wants you to preach out of the storefront. Maybe God wants you to go to Haiti and preach to people. Maybe God wants you to go to a uh, prison and preach. Maybe God wants you to go to the hospital. Maybe God wants you to go to the county jail. But see, that ain't glamorous. And when you're doing this unglamorous stuff, it can be rough. Yeah. I'll never forget the first time I preached in a prison. It was before I became a, a, a correction officer. In fact, it was that experience that made me want to become a correction officer. Because I figured I was already inside of the jail, I could do more ministry. But the first time I preached in the county jail, Berlin County Jail, I'm standing up at the podium, have my Bible open, getting ready to preach, and an inmate jumps from one side of the room to the other and stabs a guy in the neck with a pencil. Blood was everywhere, they dragged the guy out, they, they beat up the guy to stab the guy, dragged him out, I'm just standing there like this. I ain't moved. So one of the, the sergeants looked at me and said, you, you act like that didn't bother you. I said, well, not really, you know. And he said, and that's when I got the idea of being a correction officer. He said, you probably make a good correction officer. And about six months later, I became one. But I share all that to say this. Ministry is not glamorous. I ministered to people that had vomit on their shirt. I ministered to people that smelled like waste. I ministered to people that were high. I ministered to people that were drunk. You know, everybody you minister to ain't gonna have on a suit and tie ready to write you a check. Amen? So Saul had to suffer. And you look at verse 9, and he said unto me, My grace, say my grace, his grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather the glory of my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, if you look at that verse, it literally tells you what the thorn in the flesh is. His suffering. That was a thorn in the flesh. It wasn't some secret sin. It wasn't some bad habit. Paul's thorn in the flesh was his suffering. And you know the thing about it is, Peter said it really good when he wrote his epistle. Peter said, think it not strange this fiery trial has come upon you. If you're going to serve Jesus, you're going to have some suffering. You know, and, and now your suffering may be different than mine, but you're going to go through some suffering. You know, you may lose some friends. You may lose some family members. You know, you may lose a job. You know, you may have to move and relocate. But whatever you have to do for God, his grace is sufficient. His grace will keep you. His grace will give you the strength to do what you have to do. Let's look at a few biblical examples uh, of how, how this process works. Let's just go through the Bible. You got Abraham. Abraham was old as dirt. <laughs> he was old. But God told Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Now, can you imagine? You, you push your 90 and somebody come to you and your wife pushing 80 and, 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 and an angel comes to you and says, you're going to have children. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but God used them. 
And when you look at a story like that, you know God got the glory because there's no way a 90-year-old man and an 80-year-old woman should be having children. Then keep moving. You got other examples. You got somebody like uh, Jonah. Jonah was a prophet that didn't want to obey God. But that didn't stop God from using him. God sent a fish to get him and take him back to where he started. So when God has his hand on you, nothing's going to stop that. When God gives you a commission, nothing's going to circumvent that. Let's keep going. Look at Samson. Samson was a whoremonger. Let's, I'm not being, I'm not, uh, he was a whoremonger. He was a drunk. Why would God call a drunk whoremonger to be a judge? But he did it for a couple of reasons. One, to show that it's not you, it's God working through you. The beautiful part of the story of Samson is this. Samson's last breath was crying out to God. Samson's last breath was, God, let me die and do what you call me to do. He didn't get the, pre get the, end, get the picture until he was on his near deathbed, but he got the picture. And that's why when you go to Hebrews, you find Samson, the drunk whoremonger, in the hall of faith. Because when God calls somebody, he qualifies you, he cleans you up, he sanctifies you. Let's keep going. You got Jeremiah. God called Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, oh, God, I'm too young. He said, don't say you're too young. I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. Yeah. Then there's Jacob, the trickster, the con artist. Hoodwinked his brother out of his blessing. Hoodwinked his uncle. Yeah, he was a hoodwinker, a crook, a con artist. God used him, but God had to break him. When he wrestled with God, in that place he named Peniel, because Peniel means I've seen God face to face. God broke his hip, and, and Jacob said, I'm not gonna let you go till you bless me, right? But he broke his hip. Why did he break his hip? He broke his hip for a couple of reasons. One, to show him, one, you're messing with God, all right? You, you, you're determined, but I'm still God. You, you, you want this blessing, but I'm still God. But the other reason was brokenness is something all of us need. See, just like Saul needed to be humble, some of us need to be humble. Some of us need to be broken. And so every time he walked with that bad hip, it was a reminder of his encounter with God. It was a reminder that the path he had to take to get to God and receive from God. But also in that encounter, Jacob learned something very valuable. If you're gonna have power with God, you gotta be surrendered to God. You can't do it in your flesh, you can't do it with your intellect, you can't do it with your intelligence, you can't scheme and connive, it's gotta be God. And that's what Jacob had to learn. So with that messed up hip, he changed his name. He said, what is your name? He said, Jacob. He said, no longer call yourself Jacob, but your name is Israel. And the name Israel means power with God. We have power with God. Christ is inside of us. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Christ is in us. You don't have to go to the temple and offer up a sacrifice anymore. Jesus became the sacrifice. He's in us. But one of the reasons why he doesn't work through us and in us like he should is because of our stubbornness, because of our pride. A lot of times God wants to do stuff for us, but our pride gets in the way. That's happened to me many times. Somebody tried to help me, oh, that's okay, I can do it myself. And, I, and, and the Holy Spirit will say, hey, hey, dummy, I sent that man to help you. A lot of times we turn away people because oh, nah, I can do it myself or that's not what I'm looking for. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. A lot of people have died because of their pride. Have you ever heard the story about the man that was uh, in a flood and he was sitting in the living room praying and the waters were rising and he said, Lord, send him deliverance. And the water came up to his chest and he had to go up to the second floor and he started praying again, Lord, send him deliverance. So while he was on the second floor, somebody came by with a rowboat and said, hey man, jump out, we'll get you, and we'll put you in the boat. He said, now I'm waiting on the Lord to deliver me. And then the water came up. He had to go up in the attic and get on the roof of the house. A helicopter came by, threw out a rope and said, hey man, grab the rope, we're gonna get you. He said, no, the Lord gonna deliver me. 
And you know what? The moral of that story is, he drowned. He died. And when he got to heaven, first thing out of his mouth was, Lord, why didn't you deliver me? And God said, fool, I sent the boat, I sent the helicopter, and you didn't take it. And a lot of us, we get boats, helicopters, and everything else coming to us, and we don't take it because of our pride, because of our ignorance, because of our stupidity, whatever you want to call it. And I've been guilty of that many times. God wants to help you, but you got to admit you need help. I'm almost finished. One of the things that um, I, I know from personal experience is the, keys to getting, the key to getting delivered from anything is until you admit you need help, you're not going to get it. I, I, on two occasions in my life, I've had to admit that I needed help. One was when I was young and I, I had a drinking problem. All the men in my family were alcoholics. My father, his father, my great grandfather, all, all of them had drinking problems. And I was headed down that same path. I took my first drink when I was about 13 years old. Yeah, believe it or not, 13 years old. My dad would give me scotch, my mother never knew this, and, and he would like put milk in it and say, here, this will put hair on your chest, you know? So the, the, the whole taste for alcohol started when I was young. And of course, when I joined the military, that got amplified. Because as you know, Brother Joe, he can tell you, the NCO club after work, everybody goes to the NCO club. Everybody, why? Happy hour. You get drinks for almost free. And that's what I started doing when I was in the military. To the point where I almost got kicked out because of my drinking problems. But I had to humble myself before my commander, before the first sergeant, and admit that I had a problem. And that's the only reason why I got a second chance. I started going to A meetings. I started going back to church. I started going to Bible study. Started serving the Lord. Started being an usher. Then I went on to be a deacon. But none of that would have happened if I didn't first admit I have a drinking problem. But God, all he wants us to do is say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, help me. You know, when I got out of the military, I had PTSD. I don't want to admit I have PTSD. That's a mental illness. I don't want to admit that. But I had to. I went to a psychiatrist because I couldn't sleep. So he started asking me a bunch of questions about, you know, well, tell me a little bit about your military experience. He said, start from the beginning and tell me some, some of the most traumatic things you've seen in the military. So I started going down the list. By the time he got finished asking me questions, he said, yeah, you got PTSD. I didn't want to hear that. I didn't want to hear that. But you know what? Because I acknowledged it, I get the help I need from God. I get the help I need from, you know, the medical community. We all need help, saints. God can't use you until you admit you need help. And that's what happened with these, these people I mentioned in the Bible. They were flawed. They were weak. They had problems. God still used them. And he used them because they were able to admit, can't do this without you, Lord. You, you know, Moses said to God, I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can't, can't talk, Lord. How are you going to have me go back, back, back to Pharaoh and, and say, let my people go? And I stutter. What did God do? Look over there. Your brother's coming. Aaron, he'll be your spokesperson. Yeah, there's no excuses. Because everywhere where you're lacking in the area, God will send something to make up the difference. Amen? Let's give the Lord some praise.